Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Lavinia Fontana, pioneering painter of the 16th century. Uh, my name is Davide Gasparotto, and I'm the senior curator of paintings here at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Uh, before we begin, uh, just a few housekeeping details. Uh, to access captioning settings, uh, please click the CC icon on your Zoom menu bar at the bottom of your screen. And the chat feature is also open to all attendees and feel free to jump in and share your thoughts uh, during the presentation. At the end of the program, we will be, uh, we will have some time. We will be able to take some questions. We will have some time for a Q&A. And please, uh, for questions, use the Q&A feature uh, to post your questions for our speaker. As you may have uh, heard or read, a few months ago, we acquired a small but truly wonderful painting on copper by Lavinia Fontana, uh, depicting the wedding feast of Cana. And as you know, Lavinia, uh, very famous late Renaissance painter from Bologna, one of the very first professional uh, female painter active in an urban context in early modern Europe. And a couple of months later, we were also so lucky to have the chance to acquire also its preparatory drawing, which recently emerged from a private collection in France. And um, compositional drawings by Lavinia Fontana are exceedingly rare, and it is so very exciting to have both works in the same collection, especially for the possibility of studying them side by side and learning more about her artistic process. Uh, while we were considering the acquisition of the painting, I was in touch uh, with Dr. Ife Brady, who will be our speaker today. And um, welcome Ife. Ife is uh, currently, in fact, Ife, I was in touch with her because Ife is currently working on a large scale exhibition examining the whole body of work by Lavinia Fontana, an exhibition scheduled to open in Dublin later in May, uh, where both actually our painting and our drawing will be exhibited. Um, so you have the opportunity to see them now together exhibited in our gallery, in one of our galleries here at the Getty until March 26, before they travel to Dublin in the spring. Uh, so it gives really me enormous pleasure to introduce uh, her today. Um, last but not least, I have to say, because Ife was a curatorial graduate intern in our department between 2017 and 2018, and I sort of witness her career development in, with some sort of pride, but also with great admiration. And Ife is currently the curator of Italian and Spanish art at the National Gallery of Ireland in Dublin. And her primary research interests relate to the study of painting techniques, materials, and artist studio practices uh, with a particular focus on 17th century Italy and Spain. The focus of, of her PhD dissertation was Guido Reni's painting technique, and she recently contributed an important and insightful essay in the, in the catalog of the exhibition on Guido Reni, currently on view at the Städel Museum in Frankfurt in Germany, later traveling to the Prado in Madrid. Ifes, but you know, is, is not uh, only 17th century, uh, but because Ife recently um, curated a project, uh, an exhibition project uh, together in partnership with the National Gallery London on the Spanish uh, 19th, early 20th century painter Joaquin Sorolla, by the way, another painter who was beloved by Mr. Getty. And she also curated an in focus exhibition on a famous series of paintings uh, depicting the parable of the prodigal son by Murillo, the great, other great Spanish 17th century painter, uh, in collaboration with the Museo del Prado in Madrid and the Meadows Museum in Dallas. 
So uh, I'm uh, it's with great pleasure that uh, without further ado, I um, give the floor to Ife. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Davide, for such a lovely introduction. I really appreciated it. Uh, as Davide has, has told you all, my name is Aoife Brady and I am the Curator of Italian and Spanish Art at the National Gallery of Ireland. And here in Dublin, I'm currently working on a large scale exhibition of the work of the pioneering 16th century artist Lavinia Fontana that will open in the National Gallery of Ireland in May, on the 6th of May of this year. And it's my absolute pleasure to speak to you today to celebrate the unveiling of two of the Getty Museum's recent acquisitions, a magnificent copper panel depicting the wedding feast at Cana by Lavinia Fontana and a very rare preparatory drawing that was used by Fontana in the production of her painting. And as Davide mentioned, I'm a former graduate intern of the paintings department at the Getty. And so it's really wonderful and special for me to see such exceptional works continue to enter the collection. And I'd like to congratulate my colleagues at the museum for acquiring these truly wonderful objects and also thank them for generously inviting me to speak to you about them today. So this morning or this evening for us here in Dublin, as you can see uh, from the window behind me, I'm going to give you a brief overview of Fontana's career and I'm going to show you a small selection of her works spanning from beginning to end before speaking in more detail about the Getty's drawing and the painting depicting the wedding feast at Cana. Lavinia Fontana is credited by many as the first female painter to have achieved professional or commercial success beyond the confines of a court or a convent. And this success was obtained in the face of considerable adversity. In many ways, Fontana defied the odds. In 16th century Italy, for example, women were frequently denied acceptance into important artist academies and guilds. And for the most part, they were not permitted to represent themselves in business negotiations. And then the great thinkers of the time tended not to consider female artists as part of the canon. So in his influential series of biographies of Renaissance masters, Giorgio Vasari devotes only one of 142 chapters to a woman artist. Now, despite the many hindrances, during her lifetime, Lavinia Fontana maintained an impressively active career while also assuming the role of a wife and a mother. Fontana rejected a lot of the genres that were traditionally deemed appropriate for female artists of the time, such as flower painting. And she's thought to have been the first woman to paint large scale public altarpieces and female nudes. She's also the first woman documented as having her own workshop and perhaps the first to have trained others to paint. And though her name might not be very familiar to us all today, she became a real celebrity of her time. And 17th century Bolognese biographer Carlo Cesare Malvasia claimed that Fontana's fees equaled or even exceeded those of renowned court painters of the time, uh, such as Anthony van Dyck, whose name is far more familiar to us today. And we know as well that she was awarded many illustrious commissions and really coveted honours over the course of her lifetime, not least of which was her work under the patronage of several popes, including Gregory VIII, Clement VII, and finally Paul V. So let's go right back to Fontana's beginnings. She was born in Bologna in 1552 to Antonia di Bernardis, whose family ran a leading publishing house in Bologna, and to Prospero Fontana, who was a successful artist of the late Renaissance period. And following a downturn in the family's fortunes, Prospero began to train his daughter to paint in the late 1560s or maybe early 1570s. And Lavinia had already been prepared to some degree for a career in the public eye. Her parents, who themselves had worked very, very hard to establish a prominent position in Bolognese society, invited local noblemen and women to act as godparents to Lavinia, taught her to read Latin, and educated her in the humanities and finally gave her a Roman name, which was very fashionable at the time among the upper class of Bologna. And the exquisitely painted self-portrait on copper that I'm showing you here demonstrates Fontana's determined self-fashioning as an educated artist from a very early stage in her career. So here she's portrayed seated in her studio with a pen in her hand, surrounded by objects that really attest to this knowledge. She truly depicts herself here as a sophisticated and literate woman. 
and behind her a series of plaster casts is displayed on shelves while you see two antique statuettes sitting prominently on her desk and these may have been gifts from clients who were aware already by this time of the young artist's interest in collecting. Now, though Lavinia was primed with the skills, the knowledge and the etiquette required to conduct a professional career, in the 16th century, she faced another challenge. Single women were not permitted to negotiate freely with their clients or to manage business matters directly. And the solution, the only solution to this for Lavinia was marriage. So her father, Prospero Fontana, was tasked with finding a suitable candidate for his daughter. So a husband who would support Lavinia's ambitions and her career while also elevating her social status. And this is a seemingly impossible feat for a father who at this time in his life could not afford to pay a substantial dowry. And yet he found a suitable suitor. So in 1577, Lavinia married Gian Paolo Zappi of the nearby town of Imola. And he is described as a man of good social standing, but with little potential for earning. And this, the couple's truly unconventional arrangement is recorded in a marriage contract, which still survives in manuscript form and will, I'm delighted to say, be displayed in our exhibition here in May. And this contract stipulated that Lavinia would continue to practice as a painter after their wedding, rather than to, to uh, withdraw to a domestic role, as would have been traditionally expected for a woman of her time. The contract also stipulated that Gian Paolo would move to Bologna and join the Fontana family household. And through this arrangement, Prospero ensured the future care of his family and facilitated his daughter in pursuing her professional career. And the small work that I'm showing you here is one of two self-portraits that Lavinia sent to her future husband's family in Imola in 1577, right before they got married. And one obvious incentive for Fontana to send these paintings to her future spouse was to show him what she looked like. The couple's marriage was arranged by their fathers, so this was to be Gian Paolo's first glimpse at his new bride. And she paints herself here as fresh-faced, stylish, well-groomed, though according to Gian Paolo's father, Severo Zappi, there was nothing extraordinary about Lavinia's appearance. And he describes her somewhat cruelly in a letter as neither beautiful nor ugly, but somewhere between the two. But it was rather Lavinia's good social standing, her talent and her capacity for earning that attracted the Zappi family. And this portrait, just like that one I showed you a moment ago, reveals Fontana's determined self-fashioning self as a sophisticated, learned and capable woman. The men in Lavinia's life and of her native city more generally were really instrumental in helping her to launch her career. And many of her earliest portraits, dating from the latter half of the 1570s and into the 1580s, depict local scholars, noblemen and high ranking members of the clergy in Bologna. And she gained access to these groups through her father's connections and their portraits proved really pivotal in establishing Fontana's reputation. Many of these early paintings were given away or sold at extremely low prices. And this was a strategy devised by her father to boost the young artist's popularity. And eventually it positioned her as the preeminent portraitist to Bologna's elite. And the man depicted here, Carlo Sigonio, was one of Fontana's earliest scholarly portrait subjects and a central figure in the promotion of the young female artist. Though he was from Modena, Sigonio was a prominent figure in Bolognese society. He was a historian and classical philologist and he held a high ranking position in Bologna's ancient university. So here Fontana has painted Sigonio in a real authoritative pose, gazing toward the viewer with a furrowed brow and a gray beard that mark him as a true man of distinction. And artworks of this kind that preserved the legacy of a scholar for posterity and depicted them surrounded by the tools of their trade in this way, such as books and desks and students, were part of a long standing tradition in Bologna one that Fontana mastered in a series of scholarly portraits painted during the early years of her career. And though Fontana found this early success painting portraits for male noble and scholarly clientele, her involvement with these sitters was largely replaced in the 1580s by a new kind of customer, ar aristocratic Bolognese women. Now, the city had a large aristocratic noble class that coveted portraits and the reforms of Gabriele Pelliotti, who was Cardinal and later Archbishop of Bologna, 
this, they permitted artists to engage with the genre of portraiture. It, it, they endorsed portraiture that captured the likeness of virtuous individuals who set a good example for others to follow. So under Pagliotti's regime, Bolognese noblewomen were encouraged to set up informal charitable groups and to engage openly with the city's cultural sphere. And these women, many of them who were wives and daughters of the city's Quaranta, who were Bologna's 40 ruling families, they formed these tight-knit elite cliques and Fontana herself infiltrated these cliques. She became part of them. So important local noble women acted as godmothers to Fontana's children. And she was on hand, of course, to commemorate the most important moments in their lives from weddings to childbirths to the death of loved ones. And they came to be some of Fontana's most important patrons and she, her fav their favorite portraitist. Fontana's popularity as an artist among the women of her hometown and later in Rome was widely celebrated by early modern writers. Carlo Cesare Malvasia, who I mentioned earlier, described flocks of women descending on Litvinia in Bologna's streets, all of whom, according to the biographer, wished for nothing more than to be portrayed by her. While Giovanni Baglioni echoes Malvasia's words with respect to Lavinia's time in Rome, where she had achieved similar or seemingly achieved similar celebrity status for her skills as a portraitist, leading her house leading to her house being incredibly busy with the comings and goings of prospective patrons. And this life-size depiction of a Bolognese noblewoman illustrates Fontana's renowned talents. It shows us exactly why she achieved such celeb celebrity in her time. The highly decorative portrait conveys her skill in rendering textiles and jewellery in minute detail. And the subject of this portrait is Costanza Alidosi, a noblewoman who, like Fontana's own husband, hailed from the nearby town of Imola. <clears throat> and Costanza was the wife of Rodolfo Isolani, who was a Bolognese senator and a prominent member of the city's aristocracy. Rodolfo's career led him to travel very frequently, and this work may have been commissioned by Costanza herself during one of her husband's absences, perhaps as a display of her personal independence. And though Fontana wasn't the first Bolognese artist commissioned to paint, paint portraits of local women, she produced portraits of women far more frequently than either of her predecessors or contemporaries. And there's no question as to why Fontana was favoured as a portraitist by female clients. So while her male counterparts were well versed in taking a sympathetic approach to the appearance of their female sitters, Lavinia's paintings went beyond that. Her portraits really focused on the power of the female sitter and the strength of their characters. And her detailed descriptions of their clothing and their jewellery formed a real manifesto of her clients' wealth. And then her sitter's husbands, of course, were satisfied in the knowledge that their wives were having their portraits painted by a fellow woman and thereby careful, their carefully protected virtuous reputations could not be called into question. The picture I'm showing you here, a monumental multi-figure portrait, is among the most acclaimed works that Fontana ever made and the first documented commission that she received from a woman. Altarpiece-like in scale and in composition, the painting here depicts five members of Bologna's Gozzadini, who were a prominent noble family and active, and active patrons of the arts in Bologna. And here Fontana shows them seated in a formal arrangement around a small table, and the figures all loom over the viewer, staring outward with these really somber expressions. A fascinating inscription on the back of the canvas, on the back of the original canvas, identifies the protagonists that Fontana depicts here. So the woman on the right, who's wearing a red wedding dress, is Laudamia Gozzadini, the patron of this work and the author of its complex iconography. And we know that Laudamia commissioned this work from Lavinia Fontana in an attempt to legitimize her position as the true Gozzadini heir, having found herself in the center of a complex and truly unenviable family drama. And the trials and tribulations of the Gozzadini were recorded in their extensive family archives, which Caroline Murphy has done some wonderful work on. And these archives, the notes in these archives, correspond with the narrative presented by Fontana in this portrait. It's a fascinating story, which I could give an entire lecture on. Uh, but alas, we are short on time, so I ought to move on. While Lavinia was famed for her depictions of women, her portrait subjects were really diverse. And while she also created portraits of adults of various backgrounds, Lavinia engaged with children as portrait subjects more frequently than any artist before her. Many of Fontana's depictions of youths 
date to the 1580s and Lavinia herself gave birth to 11 children between 1578 and 1595, making this subject of, of childhood quite a natural choice for the artist at this time of her life. And along with her appreciation for motherhood, it was likely Fontana's gender and maybe more importantly, the sensitivity that she afforded to her sitters that attracted parents who wished to have their offspring's image immortalized. Sadly, in 16th century Italy, infant mortality was incredibly common. Prospective parents were encouraged to come to terms with the fact that the possibility of losing a son or daughter in childbirth or so shortly thereafter was high. In a sermon delivered on the 15th of December, 1577, Gabriele Pagliotti, who was then Archbishop of Bologna, reminded his congregation that they should consider themselves fortunate if God chose to grant them the blessing of children, but they should be cognizant that such a gift was often accompanied by much pain and sorrow. And it's perhaps unsurprising then that there existed a demand for portraits of noble children, commemorating those lost and celebrating those who survived. Of the 11 children born to Lavinia and her husband, Gian Paolo, only four survived to adolescence. So Fontana's personal experience of this kind of trauma made her well-placed to engage with bereaved parents in the creation of representations of lost little ones. Here, Fontana depicts an unknown noble child swaddle, laying swaddled in an ornate cradle with her gaze gently turned toward the viewer. And this strange painting has been the subject of considerable debate and scholarship of recent decades. The cradle itself is highly ornate and decorated with gilding and lace and the baby within it is adorned with pearls indicating its aristocratic status. And the scene represents one of the only extant illustrations of the furniture used in 16th century nurseries. So the canopy that sits on top of the cradle is arranged in a way that must have some significance and maybe gives us a clue as to the meaning of this picture. While the artist has carefully constructed the wooden frame with perfectly symmetrical or ornamentation, she has painted the fabric of this canopy with irregular folds that appear quite deliberate. And this irregular irregularity is further emphasized by the lace ribbons that wrap around the uprights of the bed frame, one of which seems to have kind of gently unfurled here on the left. And it's been suggested in the past that this may be symbolic and that we may be looking at a commemorative portrait for a newborn that has passed away. Fontana's involvement with her clients' family lives went beyond portraits of their offspring. She also specialised in works that sp served specific functions in the early modern household. Some of her small religious scenes would have had protective and didactic functions in the Renaissance home, for example. Devotional paintings depicting the Madonna and Christ child or the Holy Family were frequently given to women as gifts in bridal trousseaus or upon becoming pregnant, and some of these were hung in bedrooms to encourage the conception of a child or the promotion of the birth of, the birth of a healthy child. Now, following the birth of a child, these paintings served an entirely different purpose. Their subjects acted as spiritual role models, educating young viewers on ways to lead a moral life. And Fontana's engagement with these subjects speaks to a growing humanist preoccupation with family life and lineage that developed in the 15th and 16th centuries in Italy and was further emphasized then during the Counter-Reformation. So these familial bonds at the time were viewed as the building blocks to a healthy society. A popular su subject for these objects was the sleeping Christ child as depicted in the small wooden panel that I'm showing you here from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And this object is believed to have once been part of a piece of furniture, maybe even an infant's cradle. And this offers a really rare insight into the function and means of display of Fontana's paintings. And such images of the slumbering infant Jesus, they were interpreted as a prefiguration of his later suffering of the crucifixion and they were seen to emphasize the fundamental humanity of Christ. So in the context of childhood, these images may have been educational. They, the sleeping Christ child was seen by 16th century moralists as a subject that was attractive to young viewers and thereby could draw their attention in and offer them the opportunity or offer parents the opportunity to teach their children about the Christian faith. In the 1590s, Fontana continued to paint portraits, but we begin to encounter the artist engaging with new genres and really unusual motifs. She begins to employ mysterious iconographies that have no clear precedent. So this picture I'm showing you here, a sacrificial scene, for example, this combines a heavenly scene 
with the depiction of an unidentified man in theatrical costume with a crown and a scepter. And then we have an animal in the center being sacrificed. So this is a con composition that defies modern interpretation. I have made some effort to interpret this picture and I write about it at length in our exhibition catalog. So if you want to hear more of my musings, you can, you can find them there. But during this period, Fontana also gained an interest in allegorical portraiture. And with this portrait of a woman as Judith, she foreshadowed Artemisia Gentileschi's more famous illustrations of the biblical theme. But unlike Artemisia's later compositions made in the 17th century, which portray Judith in the midst of the grisly act of decapitating Holofernes, here Fontana shows the aftermath where Judith presents the Assyrian general's head in one hand kind of like a trophy while her, her maid stands supportively behind her. And Fontana shows little evidence of the bloody scene that has just taken place. She chooses instead to depict Judith as calm, collected and dignified. And interestingly, comparison between this image of Judith and Fontana's earlier self-portraits should suggest that Fontana has here portray portrayed herself in the guise of the biblical heroine. And these kinds of allegorical portraits communicated the qualities of the sitter, virtuosity, strength and piety. In the same period, Fontana began to venture beyond, far beyond the confines of the subject matter traditionally deemed appropriate for women artists of the time. Using myth and allegory as vehicles for eroticism, she made a series of bold paintings that pushed the boundaries of what a lady of virtue was permitted to create. Fontana was active in the wake of the Counter-Reformation, a period during which artists were advised against addressing such erotic subject matter. And one of the primary advocates of artistic reforms during this period was the aforementioned Cardinal and Archbishop of Bologna, Gabriele Pagliotti. And Pagliotti's famous discourse on sacred and profane images of 1582 warned of the dangers associated with mythological images, but he also conceded that artists were permitted to paint these kinds of scenes for scholarly purposes and for display in private re residences. So artists took advantage of this concession and they created erotic images thinly veiled as mythological scenes. And a niche market for these paintings emerged quite rapidly in the 16th century based entirely on private demand, which followed the principle, that, principle of that which is not allowed in public is acceptable if hidden. And Lavinia's engagement with these, this market made her the first woman to paint female nudes. And these two paintings together present a fascinating and rare example of an allegorical portrait which can be read alongside its formal counterpart. So the two women that we see here are almost identical in their facial features, their expressions and their poses, making it pretty easy to conclude that the paintings depict the same person, Isabella Ruini, purportedly the reigning beauty of late 16th century Bolognese society. In Fontana's Venus and Cupid on the right, the Bolognese noblewoman appears semi-nude, covered only in extraordinarily delicate transparent fabric and fine jewels similar to those worn by her clothed counterpart on the left. This work was unsurprisingly not intended for the public eye. Its original recipient was most likely Isabella Ruini's husband, who would have displayed it in private bedchambers, perhaps even behind a curtain. It's been suggested by scholars that Fontana's racy image of the noblewoman as a nude Venus was, in fact, constructed based on her client's specific instructions, who wished to give it as a gift to her spouse, a gift of an image that would appeal to his desires. In the final years of the 1590s, Lavinia Fontana painted what is today considered the most ambitious work that she ever made, the visit of the Queen of Sheba to King Solomon, here in our collection in the National Gallery of Ireland. Monumental in size and really extraordinarily detailed, the origins of this mysterious painting have been sh shrouded in mystery for many centuries, but a recent large scale conservation and research project fund funded by the Bank of America Art Conservation Project has revealed many hidden secrets in this painting. And again, this is a story for a different lecture entirely, but one worth reading if you have an opportunity. In the same year she, she, as she created that complex biblical scene that I've just shown you, Fontana also painted the monumental vision of St. Hyacinth. And this canvas was commissioned by Cardinal Girolamo Benerio for his chapel in Santa Sabina and is the first altarpiece by a woman to have been displayed publicly in Rome. Encouraged by Benerio and his patronage, between 1603 and 1604, Fontana left Bologna for the Eternal City. 
and she's followed shortly by her husband and their four surviving children, as well as her aging mother, as per the terms of the Fontana Zappi marriage contract. And from what we can glean, the years spent in Rome seem to have been both lucrative and challenging for the artist. So shortly after arriving, as detailed by the family's baptismal records, Lavinia's 14-year-old daughter, Laudamia, passed away and left the artist utterly devastated. Letters from this period reveal that she was also beginning to suffer with age-related health problems like arthritis. But despite these hardships, Fontana once again found success against the odds. Shortly after the family's moved, she was, she was established as a portraitist at the Vatican Palace, working for Pope Paul V, a member of the Borghese family and former, formerly papal legate in Bologna. And she was patronized by many prominent figures during her Roman period, including the King of Persia. The final canvas that Fontana painted in Rome was this one I'm showing you here, Minerva Dressing, a large scale composition for the Pope's nephew, uh, Scipione Borghese. And this large scale composition depicts Minerva, the Roman goddess of peace, war, wisdom, and the arts. And while Fontana includes the goddess's identifying attributes, so an armor, a helmet, an owl, an olive tree, the image that she presents is far from conventional. So while traditionally Minerva is depicted wearing many of these attributes, here Fontana paints her from behind, completely nude, with the items scattered around her. Now, just one year after the completion of this work, <clears throat> on the 11th of August, 1614, at the age of 62, Lavinia Fontana died. And a Roman dispatch sent to the court of, Ur of Urbino two days later read that on Monday passed to the other life Lavinia Fontana from Bologna, a singular painter among women of our age who was on a par with the first men of that profession. So at this point, she has, you know, gained real recognition for her art. So now that you have a little bit of context about the life and work of Lavinia Fontana, we can bring our focus to the Getty's two wonderful recent acquisitions, a small devotional painting on copper panel and the preparatory drawing used to create it, both made by Lavinia Fontana. The wedding feast at Cana depicts an episode de described in the Christian Bible's Gospel of John, during which Christ, who was invited to a wedding with his mother and disciples, turns water into wine. The elaborate copper panel painting and the associated preparatory sketch are really important recent additions to the artist's oeuvre, and together they illustrate Fontana's ability to exe execute complex religious subjects on a small scale at an early stage in her career. So stylistically, the painting that we see on the left can be dated to the mid-1570s or early 1580s, and this is a period in which Fontana was establishing herself as one of Bologna's foremost painters of not only portraiture, but also devotional scenes like that illustrated here. The sketch on the right represents one of only two surviving preparatory drawings that can be securely attributed to the artist. So this rare discovery, when it's considered in tandem with the painted composition, offers absolutely unparalleled insights into Fontana's methods of production and demonstrates the methodical planning involved in the realisation of the painted composition. This is something I'll return to in a few moments. Fontana has exploited the subject matter here as an opportunity to depict a grand feast in a complex architectural setting. Christ and the Madonna are depicted with halos seated at the center of the banquet table next to a newly married couple on the left. Christ's right hand is raised toward a glass held by a servant in the foreground, which now contains red wine. And this suggests that we as viewers have just now witnessed the moment in which Christ's miracle was performed. The composition is alive with iridescent pinks and blues, yellows, reds, which stand out vibrantly against a largely black and white architectural backdrop. And the radiance of the figure's jewel-toned draperies can be linked to the surface that Fontana was working on in this painting. As a non-absorbent support, copper imparted a luminosity to pigments that wasn't achievable when you painted on canvas, which is absorbent. And the artist here has carefully built up her painting using semi-transparent glazes of colour, and this creates a wonderful depth and iridescence in her, in her colours. And despite the painting's small size, the bride's veil and her jewellery are rendered with an attention to detail characteristic of Fontana's work. Given its subject matter, which is often interpreted as Christ's support of earthly marriage, the painting may have been commissioned to celebrate a noble wedding. 
It might even have been part of the bride's trousseau in keeping with the many paintings that Fontana and others created to commemorate important moments of the lives of their female clients, including weddings. This painting reveals the young artist's ability to assimilate and reinterpret the work of her predecessors in novel ways, again, from a very early stage in her career. It was inspired by a work of the same subject, painted first by, by Giorgio Vasari in 1566 for the refectory of San Pietro in Perugia. And Vasari also made a smaller autograph copy of this picture, which is today in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts in Budapest. But Prospero Fontana worked very closely with Vasari as both a student and later a collaborator. And then Prospero himself painted a work inspired by his former ma master's wedding feast, which is today in the collection of the Pinacoteca Nazionale di Bologna. Several details of Lavinia Fontana's painting, painted composition differ from those of both her father and Vasari, most notably the expansive staircase that dominates the center of the background in Lavinia's picture and the poses of some of her figures. And these differences reveal Lavinia's precise source of inspiration. It's not her father's painting or Vasari's, but rather preparatory drawings, Vasari's preparatory drawings. Two early sketches for Vasari's painted composition reveal what we believe to be the artist's preliminary ideas. So one on the left-hand side here depicts a similar staircase to that in Fontana's final work. And the one on the right then shows a foreground figure proffer proffering wine to Christ with the same downturned gaze and contorted pose as we see in Fontana's panel. Prospero Fontana's version of the wedding feast at Cana similarly includes details that appear only in Vasari's drawings, suggesting that both he and his daughter consulted these sketches and they may even have been in the family's collection. The preparatory st study for this painting offers unparalleled insights into the artist's working methods. Some minor details of the painting deviate from the initial plan mapped out by Fontana in her study, but the format of the drawing is reproduced with striking accuracy in her finished painted work. As Getty curators and conservators have recently discovered, and there is a wonderful article about this online that I would like to direct you to, and I'm sure our colleagues can put a link to it in the chat, box, but they recently discovered through this infrared reflectogram of the painted panel, this, this offers a glimpse of what lies beneath the uppermost uh, layer of paint, uh, several details which appear in Lavinia's drawing but are omitted from her final composition. These were originally included in the early stages of the painting process, but then she later paints them out. And these included the additional figures huddled in front of a credenza or sideboard on the left-hand side of the composition, and they're clearly visible here in the drawing of the left, it's these two figures here. They're barely visible in the infrared reflectogram of the painting in the center. You can see them just about in front of the credenza. And then they're omitted entirely from the final painted composition on the right. So this suggests that Fontana transferred the outline of her drawing in its entirety onto her copper support and then continued to adapt the composition as she worked. She decided later on that she no longer required or wanted to include those figures in the composition and painted over them. Evident on the paper surface are indentations, revealing the artist's transfer process, which is again, very rare and unusual and wonderful. Um, so th these indentations tell us how she transferred the image from paper to copper panel. So she first would have prepared the copper panel with a thin layer of gesso, and then probably used a stylus to trace her drawing onto the new support, applying pressure around some of the contours of the figures that we see here and the architectural elements to act as a guide in the execution of her finished painting. In addition, she drew a grid on the bottom right-hand corner of the sketch, and this assisted the artist in shifting elements from this area a little lower into the painted composition. And some wonderful indented perspectival lines can also be seen in raking light if you look closely at the drawing, and I encourage you all to go and see it in the gallery so you can pick these details out for yourself. My photographs won't show everything perfectly uh, online, unfortunately. But these perspectival lines, they didn't form part of the finished composition, but they assisted the artist in achieving a convincing sense of depth while she was working. And while surviving drawings like this are unusual within Fontana's oeuvre, 
she made use of incisions to map out compositions throughout her career. So this is quite consistent. These extraordinary objects serve to increase our understanding of Lavinia Fontana's early development, as well as her working methods. And they offer unparalleled insights into the artist's practice during the initial phase of her career, during which she was working closely alongside her father, Prospero, while also forging her own artistic identity. This kind of information is really invaluable in the study of early modern women artists whose work can sometimes be overlooked due to a preoccupation with their biography. You know, though Lavinia is discussed more by early Italian biographers than any other 16th century woman artist, the authors provide little insight into her working methods. And as Babette Bonn has observed in her recent book on the women artists of Bologna, attention to women's beauty, their virtue and their and personal anecdotes at the expense of any serious consideration of their work is found everywhere in 16th and 17th century texts. So I'm grateful to my colleagues at the Getty for their commitment to furthering the representation of women in their collection and for bringing these two works together to be viewed in tandem. Together, they illustrate this prodigious young artist's beginnings and hint at the incredible career that laid before her as the first professionally successful woman artist in Europe. I'm going to leave it there for this morning's lecture and I invite you all to place your questions in the chat box. Davide and I will look forward to discussing them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ife, for this very insightful and interesting uh, overview uh, of the career of this incredible artist and also for this special focus on the uh, two wonderful uh, objects that we were so lucky to have the opportunity to acquire. Um, so while you were talking, I just look a little bit, there are some very interesting questions and, you know, uh, and I will try to sort of uh, guide you through the process. So I think there is, so first of all, some people asked uh, if the exhibition in Dublin will travel elsewhere. I'm afraid not, it, it's a Dublin only. So it, it'll open in Dublin on the 6th of May and it'll be on display here until the 27th of August. Um, it will be the, the first monographic exhibition, the first exhibition dedicated exclusively to Fontana in 25 years. Uh, and we're, we're bringing together around 65 objects. So I encourage any of you who can to, to come to visit and we'd be delighted to host you here at the National Gallery of Ireland. Good, so we will have to come to Dublin. And, and then someone asked also, and this may be something we can even post, but uh, if there is a good current book about her. There, there are a few. I mentioned Babette Bond's recent, uh, recent publication on women artists and their patrons in Bologna that I would recommend highly. And then if you want to read about Fontana specifically, one of the best monographs in English was by an author named Caroline Murphy. It was published in 2003, but it's still an invaluable resource for information on the life of the artist. Good. Then I think there is a lot of curiosity about the nudes and so also to her access to models or, or if she modeled herself, or I think this is an important question. It's a great question. It's a really interesting one and, and one that I've been musing over quite a lot as we, we work on this. I mean, it's something that that academics, scholars of this period have acknowledged for a long time that one of the major disadvantages to Lavinia was, was the, the fact that she wasn't able to draw from the nude. She didn't have access to that, uh, to that method of training. She, she didn't have access to artists' academies and it wouldn't have been deemed appropriate for her to have, have studied from nude models in this period in Bologna. I think that it's likely that she probably gained what grasp she has of female anatomy from from herself. And of course, you know, mirrors were were accessible and an easy way. This is something that we acknowledge with the in the case of Artemisia, that, you know, using oneself, your own body was a cheap and, and easy way to um, to to paint from the nude. But it's unlikely that she had access to, to real new mo nude models now. And there was, I think you said that, so you said that there was a related question about her training. I think you mm. said that she was trained by her father. Uh, maybe you can say a little bit more about 
is seems to be a trend for many female artists of the early modern period. It was really one of the only ways in this period that a woman would be able to learn to paint outside of, of a convent or a court. Um, but yes, Lavinia was trained by her father. It was a natural way for her to, to train, I suppose. And we we see that she probably began to train informally as a teenager, but hit the training ramps up in her late teens, early 20s, when the family begin to run into financial difficulty and, and her professional career becomes more important. But the kind of training that she had is very difficult to ter- determine. There's no, there are no extant documentary records of the sort of training that she might have underwent. But she would have had access to Prospero Fontana's studio. She would have been trained by him directly. And she would also have encountered the artists that come through, came through his studio, such as, um, such as Giorgio Fasari, for example, that we discussed during this lecture. And also to his collection of prints and drawings and, and statues and, and, um, and objects like um, plaster casts. So she was, she had that going for her, I suppose that was one major advantage of having a father as a painter. I don't, otherwise it would have been almost impossible. They weren't, she would not have been permitted to train alongside young male artists. Yes, yes. And and so then there are, there is curiosity about sort of uh, decorative elements in the paintings, I mean, uh, jewelry. So obviously, a, an indicator of the status, the social status of sitters. But mm-hmm. I think the curiosity here is, uh, is the, there can be also like a symbolic meaning of certain type of jewelries and also dogs. So there is an interest in the presence of dogs and their meaning in their paintings. It's, they're both very interesting questions. And I think it, it, with respect to her portraits, while absolutely jewellery and specific jewels can carry symbolic meaning, particularly in, in devotional pet paintings, for example, in this instance, they are more of a manifesto of the sitter's wealth. So we can identify a lot of the jewellery depicted in Fontana's pictures as that described in records of bridal trousseaus or cardity of the time. So we know that these are real pieces of jewellery that were owned by the people that she was painting. And we even have evidence of her borrowing borrowing jewelry to take it back to her studio and paint it you know with in in minute detail to make sure that she was representing every single jewel every piece of gold that the sitter owned there are contracts uh, regarding these these loans of very expensive jewels so uh, the same goes for for the dogs which is really interesting again can carry symbolic value in in many different contexts but in this context the dog these little lap dogs often referred to as cani bolognese These dogs were accessories and they were very expensive accessories that were incredibly popular in 16th century Bologna. And we see them, these small spaniels again and again. Um, Sometimes they are even decked out with jewellery. We see spaniels that have their own little earrings and um, ornate collars. So this is very much, I I often compare them to to, uh, some of the celebrities we see with teacup chihuahuas. They were used as sort of fashion accessories. They were things that were deemed um, trendy at the time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, there is also curiosity about the use of coppers, and which is, I think, is a very important topic here, mm-hmm. and also how they were prepared. How you know? So yes. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the importance of copper and the role it played in Lavinia's production. It's that's another great question, and it's something I didn't have time to really go into in detail here, but I'm happy to know. I, copper was introduced to Bologna by a Flemish painter, Dennis Calvert. He's credited at least with introducing it to Bologna and he collaborated extensively with Prospero Fontana. So that is likely how Lavinia at a young stage or an early stage of her career learned the technique of painting on copper. And copper panels were coveted in the late 16th century into the 17th century. They were very frequently given as gifts. They were included, as I said, in, in, our, in the talk just now in br- bridal trousseaus. And they were valued because they were sort of jewel-like in their appearance. That hard, non-absorbent um, surface created these wonderful, radiant pictures, just like that the, the wedding feast at Cana that we've been we've been talking about. So people loved these 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 objects for their sort of preciousness, and they were also portable. These small copper panels could be easily transported and given given as gifts. Um, 
in terms of the way that they were prepared, it wasn't entirely dissimilar to how one would prepare a, cop a, a canvas support. So they would be scored to create a rough surface and then a gesso or a light plaster would be applied to create a smooth surface and a, an absorbent surface to which the oil paint could adhere. And then you would paint in the same way as you might on, on a canvas support. The big difference was that the canvas support is absorbent so that the colour would seep into the canvas essentially and, and its preparations, whereas it sits on top of this non-absorbent copper and creates these incredible uh, colourful compositions. And I think we can really say that she was uh, also a pioneer in this field, you know, because uh, in some way the following generation, the Carracci and then the pupil of the Carracci, Guido Reni himself, they all used extensively copper for these kind of small pictures for, you know, or private devotion or just for landscapes. For... So she was, really, she was really a pioneer also in this area in some way. In, she really copper. was. She was exposed to it right at the moment in which it was introduced to Italy. Uh, so it's um, quite extraordinary. She's a woman of, of very many firsts. Mm -hmm. There are some other curiosity about the your exhibition. Uh, so someone is asking how many artworks will be in your exhibition? Uh, will the Getty works travel? That I can answer. They will <laughs> both travel. To Thank you. <laughs> and will any other artists work featuring conversation with Fontanas in your show? That's several questions. Let me see how many works in the first. <laughs> how many instance. works? Yes, we so. have we have approximately 65, 65, 70, um, depending on what you count as one object. <laughs> and it's it's not exclusively paintings, as as I mentioned. We we will have paintings. We'll have a selection of drawings, of works on paper. So we have the Getty's preparatory sketch, but we also have others. Fontana is the first woman artist to whom we can attribute ex extant drawings. So again, another first and, and a very important aspect of her oeuvre and an important thing, in my view, to, to bring into the exhibition to show people a full sort of spectrum of what she could do. So we'll have those. And then we'll have a select, I've, I've limited the number of works by other artists because I want to celebrate Fontana um, almost exclusively, but we will have works by Prospero, for example, to show where she is, where she is her, 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 her development is, is sort of originating from. But, and we will also have a selection of 16th century textiles and some objects um, which will correspond with the objects and the jewellery that you see in many of these portraits. So the idea is that you can come to the exhibition and you'll, you'll, you'll get a sense of what it was like to be in 16th century Bologna. You'll get a sense that the portraits that you're looking at are grounded in Pontana's reality. And I hope that people will feel transported in some way to, to 16th century Bologna. Someone is asking you if you can say a little bit more about sort of her style of painting. So how does it fit into the mm -hmm. you know, an overall picture of the late 16th century? Sure. I, Fontana is sort of straddles two periods. And these are all periods, I suppose, that we as art historians have created or defined, but the period traditionally referred to as Mannerist um, into the Baroque. And so while she's grounded in what we would describe as Mannerist tradition, so these sort of contorted figures, sort of surreal looking, um, not so naturalistic figures and poses and also colours, she later begins to move toward what we would associate with Baroque naturalism. So some of her later paintings begin to show the influence of the Caracci family in Bologna. They were very instrumental in, in the move away from the Mannerist style in Bologna. Um, and then she, she, of course, goes to Rome. We don't quite see Caravaggio uh, having, having the effect that on, on Lavinia that, she had on other, that he had on other painters of that time, but she certainly does you know, absorb more of this naturalism into her work as her career progresses. But her, her grounding is in what we would describe as the Mannerist period. And uh, another interesting question, I think, is that if we know something about her workshop with potential assistance, uh, I don't know. We if know about this. No, that no one has ever written about it, and I, as it, it's it's a nice question to get because I've actually written about Fontana's workshop for the exhibition catalogue that will be published um, in celebration of this exhibition that will open in Dublin in May. And I've attempted to sort of piece together what we can between technical analysis of paintings and 
documentary resources and then my own visual analysis of paintings and how to try and create a picture of how Fontana painted and how her workshop might have functioned. And we can glean some things when you start to really read uh, letters closely and inventories closely. We know, for example, that she did at least t teach her own daughter to paint, Laudemia, and supposedly Laudemia before she passed away at 14 was quite an accomplished or considered quite an accomplished painter. Giulia Mancini was a physician and an author in the early 17th century and knew Fontana personally. And so he's the person, he's the most reliable source for this information. And he describes his, her daughter as having been a painter. And there's also mentions of, of a, a girl from the Gozzadini family that she similarly trained to paint. So we have very scant information. I mentioned this at the end of the talk. People tend not to focus on artists' workshops, women artists' workshops or their technique. They tend to become preoccupied historically with their biographies, with their stories. Uh, so I'm trying to sort of reorientate our understanding and our view of Fontana to focus more on her extraordinary skill in painting. Yeah. And, and in some way, no, I don't know if you agree, but this environment of Bologna seemed to be very central to her development. It's very, in some way, there was kind of more perhaps freedom for women. It was a very cultivated environment because of the university. So do you think that this had an impact in some way on her development as an artist? I think without a doubt. I think Bologna was, was the only environment in which she could have become who she became. As, uh, as you say, Davide, it, had, it, had, it, had, it still has Europe's oldest university and reportedly Fontana herself gained a degree from said university. So that would give you an indication of how liberal it was considered or it was, the city was at the time. And then I had also mentioned that Pagliotti, who was the archbishop for a period in Bologna during Fontana's lifetime, he encouraged women to be more visible in society. He encouraged them to engage more with civic life. And so those kinds of liberties, they weren't liberties that were afforded to everybody in, 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 in Italy at this, in, during this period. He, sim similarly, sumptuary laws had been relaxed to some, some degree in Bologna, so women could, you know, exit the house wearing some, some finery. And uh, it was a very, very different place to much of the rest of the peninsula in the 16th century. Mm -hmm. We may have time for a, a last question, and it's about her sort of success, uh, not also in terms of recognition of the talent, her fame, but also in terms of her economic, socioeconomic success. Did, because I think at some point there were some issues, you know, some struggles. We don't have an awful lot to tell us how well she did financially. Now, mm. 17th century biographer who's writing quite a long time, this is Carlo Cesare Malvasia, Malvasia who I mentioned, he's writing, you know, over 50 years after Fontana's death, he talks about her fees equaling or exceeding other renowned court painters of her day. Whether that's true or not is 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 very hard to establish. Mm -hmm. We know that we know that her family, her father, had financial issues. He became ill and could no longer work, having you know uh, achieved quite a lot of success in his younger years. But her mother had some fortune from her her parents' publishing house in Bologna, so they weren't. They weren't um, destitute, I don't think. But by that token, but in saying that, Prospero couldn't afford to pay a dowry to her, her to Lavinia's husband's family, and this was unprecedented in the 16th century. It was almost, you know, obligatory to pay a dowry. So the family weren't rich by any stretch. We know that by the time she goes to Rome, that she's doing quite well, and that she 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 very quickly is is um, given lodgings, and then she she's made a portraitist to the Vatican Palace, but we have no extant account books that tell us what kind of money she was really making at this time. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think we, we responded to many of the questions. We may then maybe send you some of the other questions and you may graciously try to answer. Sure. But thank you, it was truly uh, wonderful. We are really grateful to you. We are really um, uh, hoping to be able to come to Dublin and see the exhibition, but there will be anyway a catalog uh, available for who is curious about uh, the career and um, artistic development of Lavinia. So 
thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great pleasure to have you, Ife. Thank you so much for having me, Davide. Thank you very much to everybody for tuning in. Continue to follow us. <laughs>